Bills, Newburgh chapter of the NAACP, Melanie Collins from the Youth Build and the young people here uh, from Youth Build, let's give them a hand. <laughs> Family and friends and all, our, our guest of honor, Governor Hoko, good afternoon. We are gathered here uh, in the city of Newburgh, New York at our uh, Heritage Center to memorialize a man who due to a mischaracterization of justice by a constituted court of public opinion and allegations imposed, uh, which imposed a death sentence without due process of law on June the 21st, 1863, during the sweltering heat of a civil war uh, was lynched. This horrific circumstance shall never be forgotten as part of our very complex history in the city of Newburgh and around the nation. It is our unbloody, untold human history that too captures the hidden colors of forever. Colors of colorful rainbows as 13 moons divide themselves in cycles of 23. Holy Father, Holy Grail. We say praises for the Holy Trinity. And we thank God for our ancestors. For we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and those who, who have been stolen from society in this fashion and beyond. It is my intent to even make a proclamation for June 21st for every year moving forward in this young man, well, this man's honor, Robert Mulliner, creating the Robert Mulliner Day here in the city of Newburgh, New York for generations to come to inspire hope, to inspire hope and equal justice for all. Once again, as I mentioned, we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and how befitting for such an auspicious occasion today to do something in the final days of Black History Month for the year of our Lord, 2022. Now I would like to uh, welcome our 57th governor for the state of New York, who is moving fast and responsibly on many great initiatives here in our state. She has the most diverse cabinet in the history of governors in the state of New York. And just to name a few initiatives that we are all excited about in Newburgh and around the state, about housing initiatives that she has, fair, decent housing without displacement, uh, her initiative on workforce development for people to get real skills to pay the bills in New York, real skills to pay the bills. And that workforce development is super important for us here in the city of Newburgh, in addition to child care and family initiatives that Governor Hoko uh, has already announced and once again has moved aggressively on uh, in just the few months that she's been in office. Um, Governor Hochul is not a stranger to the city of Newburgh, New York. She's been here at least three or four times, many occasions, uh, when she was the lieutenant governor. We welcomed her here with open arms, and we welcome you again today and many days beyond. You're always welcome in our city, um, and we are very, very appreciative to the hard work that you have and continue to do for the working class people. Uh, which is another initiative that you've announced in your state of a state uh, address. Lastly, I want to say, um, as the mayor of the city of Newburgh, and I'm sure uh, all the mayors in this, throughout the state of New York, including uh, Mayor Kelly uh, Decker, who's here from Port Jervis, she knows what that walk is like because she was once a mayor. And I remember uh, Governor Hochul telling me that on one of her visits that she was the mayor in her previous uh, elections and, and past political life with uh, at Buffalo, I believe it was Buffalo, New York. And so, um, you know, I'm just so, so happy to have you here uh, once again for a bittersweet occasion. Um, facing history in ourselves uh, is very important uh, in Newburgh, throughout the state, and throughout the country. So 
without further ado, come on, guys, let's give it up for Governor Kathy Hochul, the 57th governor in the state of New York. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the enthusiastic welcome, uh, Mayor Harvey. And no, this is not my first time, not my second time, not my third time. I come here a lot because I really believe in this community. I have a chance now as governor, but certainly in seven, eight years as lieutenant governor, to travel every corner of the state. And I also go to communities and I have this sense of possibility. And I sometimes see some jewels that aren't quite as polished as they should be. And those are the ones that need that extra attention. And I'm so proud to see the rebirth of Newburgh unfolding before our eyes. Uh, your leadership has been instrumental in uniting this community and letting us also see neighborhoods that have been left forgotten. And the history that's here but was never properly celebrated or acknowledged. And as we were here before, we talked about the Thorn Willow Press and we walked to that building and talked about that neighborhood, Liberty Street, I, be I believe, and how it's coming back. And I had a chance to see how they're making not just the book binders, but they actually print the stationery for the White House there. I mean, this is pretty significant to know this history as well. And I've seen what's happening. There's going to be more restaurants and hotels coming and spas. I mean, you're getting pretty fancy here having spas and everything. I might have to check in for a weekend in Newburgh. And, uh, so I, I, I'm really excited about what I see here in places like Newburgh and Port Jervis and places along uh, the Hudson River. They're just so vital. And uh, I do appreciate um, acknowledging my past history as a local official. I never ascended to be mayor of Buffalo. I want to set the record straight. That my, my good friend Byron Brown would not appreciate that. <laughs> uh, mayor Brown, your job's safe. Uh, I was a local uh, government official, but for many years, and I did walk the walk, and I know what it was like at that most local, direct level of government where everybody knows you are. People can come to your board meetings and tell you what's on their minds, and you have to be responsive and accountable, and that's how I... Uh, was steeled in the knowledge of public service and how, how it really touches people's lives so directly. So to our mayors, uh, I want to thank also uh, Kelly Decker, Mayor of Port Jervis, for joining here. Another elected official I've had a chance to work with for a long time since his local days, and that's Jonathan Jacobson, our great assembly member. Great to see you here as well. I don't know if Steve Newhouse made it here yet. Uh, okay, 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 I don't know, I can't tell you. There you go, Steve Newhouse. So we've done many events together as well. Uh, great to see you as well, County Executive. So, so glad to have you here. So yes, this is, as you heard, Black History Month. Uh, we are talking about there's the positive history, and then there's the history that no one wanted to look at, the history that was swept under the rug, the history that was never told because of the shame associated with it. But black history means we have to tell the whole story. The whole story needs to be unfolded. And be at a heritage center like this, it really lends itself to opening up our hearts and our stories and passing them on to the next generation to let them know that uh, maybe the people before us weren't enlightened enough to talk about this, but we are here in 2022 prepared to spread some light on what has happened before. And you think about history overall, in the state of New York, we are so proud of how leaders from generations ago stepped up and took that mantle. And I think about leaders like Frederick Douglass and how he used his great oratory skills to move not just civil rights, but also women's rights. And we're just almost on the verge of Women's History Month. So it's a great intersection. I've been to Frederick Douglass's grave site many times in Rochester. He's not buried far from his friend, Susan B. Anthony. The two of them were powerhouses, but he is the one who went to Seneca Falls. And there was talk about whether or not women should have the right to vote, this first gathering. And he was one of the few men, certainly the only African-American in the room. But he stood up with great eloquence and persuaded the women in the room that yes, you should continue to fight onward and that even unattainable goal that you're all talking about, that you're not quite sure you can get there, the right to vote, you should ask for that as well. So Frederick Douglass is an important part of our history. So Jordan Truth, 45 minutes down the road, uh, and we'll be talking about her in a couple of days, acknowledging her great work, but this is where she gave her Ain't I a Woman speech. 
uh, something that still inspires us to this day. Harriet Tubman, people thought she was this his tiny person from Maryland, and she came back and forth and freed the slaves, and she was so courageous. I read her book when I was eight years old. I checked it out of the library so often because I was inspired by the grit of this tiny woman that the librarian says, why don't you just keep it? No, I had to, I had to pay for it, but, <laughs> uh, but it was my book. It was my story, and I still think about how that inspired me as a child. And she didn't just stay in Maryland. She lived 50 years in Auburn, not far from we have our own Equal Rights Heritage Center. If you've not visited, I encourage you to go to this place uh, outside of Syracuse in Auburn, New York. And also, this is where Dr. King, right after there had been an assassination attempt on him earlier, luckily this was, this was an unsuccessful one because he had many, years, many more years to give back, uh, he talked about his belief in nonviolent protest, even though there had already been violence against him. And I remember to this day, when we lost Dr. King, yes, I'm that old, I'm older than a lot of you, uh, but I was a child who knew his story, whose parents talked about him, whose parents were involved in the civil rights movement as social justice Catholics in the town I grew up in. Our family didn't have much, but we had heart, and we also had a sense of what was right and wrong, and so my parents were involved in the movement to integrate white communities, and my parents were ostracized for those beliefs, and as a child, I saw what people said and did to my mom and dad, but you know what, it all made us part of this movement, uh, the civil rights movement of the 60s and how we got laws passed, voting rights laws, civil rights laws that were so important at the time. And then of course, this is where Shirley Chisholm said she wanted her seat. She was not gonna be told what to do and she you know, says, I'm taking my folding chair if I have to to the, power, the seats of power. So what an inspiration she is. So all this happened in New York and there's a lot of other states out there. I mean, not that I'm going to talk about them at all, but this is New York, and I'm so proud of this history. And uh, even, you know, we have our great leaders from the NAACP here, Ray Harvey. Uh, the NAACP started in Buffalo, the early Niagara movement, which became an outgrowth and blended in with another movement that became the NAACP. It's right here in our state. But we also have side of history that people, as I mentioned, don't want to talk about. And that is the story that was referenced by our mayor here. And you always think about lynchings, you think of the South, right? That's what they did down there. That didn't happen in a place of enlightenment like New York, where the slaves came for freedom, people came for a new life here, the abolitionists gathered here. Well, guess what? That is not an accurate portrayal of our history, because two men, separated by 30 years, but accused of the exact same offense, falsely accused of rape, both of them in police custody, surrounded by a mob. The mob takes them out of police company, custody and takes them out and lynches them. 30 years apart in two communities, not far away from each other, here in the great state of New York. Have you heard that story before? Have you heard that before? I'm going to guess that most people have never heard of Robert Mulliner, who was killed in Newburgh in 1863, or Robert Lewis, killed in Port Jervis in 1892. From this day forward, people will know their names, and they'll read about them, and they'll know this as part of the history that we have turned a blind eye to for too long. But we talk about that because you have to talk about it and say we'll stare that down to make sure that it never ever happens again in our society, that we stand up for everyone. That's a reminder of who we are as New Yorkers. So I want that to be an inspiration, uh, to know that there is a history. And if we continue to memorialize these individuals and talk about them, and we'll see the plaques in a couple minutes, young people will understand that there's a history we want to celebrate and talk about, and then there's the history that exposes the reality of why people had to take to the streets and march forward and make sure that today in 2022 we are continuing to call out discrimination and hatred wherever it rears its ugly head. That's what today is about here in the state of New York. We also, thank you. We're also here to announce 400 years of African American History Commission that was first, first signed at the very end, the final hours of 2019.
exactly 400 years when the first slaves were brought to Virginia. And I don't know why, but the commission was never launched, even though it was passed back then. So I, as governor, am announcing seven of my appointees to the other eight so we can get this commission going and to find the stories and tell the great, the, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifference, the, 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 the accomplishments and talk about that in a way that'll be educational and people understand this. And so I'm really proud that I'll be announcing my appointees. Uh, in fact, I'll do it right now. And uh, yeah. someone we all know, right? <laughs> someone who is very dear to me, who has been a, 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 not just a friend, but a, a, more of a mother to me, is that is Mama Dukes, Hazel Dukes. Uh, Dr. Hazel Dukes is going to be, uh, who's the president of the NAACP. She's been an incredible fighter for a long time. Also, uh, Dr. Lori Woodward, a prize-winning history and black studies professor at the City College of New York, will be joining our commission. Dr. Henry Taylor, a professor at the University of Buffalo, who uh, I've known very well, who works on redevelopment of cities and social and economic justice. Dr. Ann C. Bailey, a writer, historian, and professor of history at SUNY Binghamton, who focuses on connecting the events of the past to today's stories. Uh, Dr. Kishi Ducree, Associate Dean of Diversity and Equity and Inclusion at Syracuse University. Now, I didn't play favorites just because I went to Syracuse University. I don't, okay, don't, don't accuse me of playing favorites here. Uh, she's very well regarded. Uh, and Jennifer Jones Austin, the CEO of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, and Joy Bivens, the director of the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture in Harlem. So, yes, we'll see plaques, but when we leave here today, I want this to be a visual reminder. I want children to stop by and ask their parents, and parents who need to know the story of why there are plaques uh, putting, put forth here and in Port Jervis, and let people know how we honor their legacy as being victims of hatred and mob mentality, and let people know that we understand that that kind of sentimentality, that evil, can no longer lurk in our hearts or certainly not in our state. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us here today.